Hello, this is Imogen Ragone at Body Learning. Robert Rickover has kindly agreed to let me use the Body Learning podcast to conduct some interviews with different Alexander Technique teachers, especially more senior or successful teachers, to find out how they go about teaching a first lesson. I believe and hope this will become a valuable resource for the rest of us. My guest today is Sandra Bain Cushman. Sandra is an Alexander Technique teacher in Charlottesville, Virginia, and she's been teaching for over 24 years. Her most recent project is Orchestral Maneuvers, which introduces the principles of the Alexander Technique to large groups and is based on the work she's done for most of her professional life with Robert Fritz, Robert Fripp's Guitar Circle and his Orchestra of Crafty Guitarists. And I have to say that I know Sandra very well as she was um, assisting teaching on the training course that I trained on in Charlottesville. So, welcome to the show, Sandra. Thank you, Imogen. I'm happy to be here. I'm very happy you're here too. So I'm very excited to learn more about your approach to a first lesson, which I never had a first lesson with you. Well, I guess I had a first lesson with you, but not a first lesson ever, if you know what I mean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, to start at the very beginning, when a prospective new student contacts you, whether that's by email or phone, do you have a particular way of handling it? Maybe specific questions you ask or information you want to give them before you meet them? Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the things that's going to happen with a lot of your interviews is I'm passing on information that I was given and advice I was given by my teachers. Mm -hmm. And one of the very salient pieces of advice was to ask people about themselves and find out what their hopes would be for taking lessons. Usually, often they come with a complaint, mm -hmm. but sometimes not. I, I work a lot with performers, and performers actually are great because they already know they need to improve their coordination. They know they want to do what they do better, and they've heard that the Alexander Technique might be a tool. So I like to ask people a bit about themselves and then adapt anything I'm going to say about the technique to what they've told me rather than going into this big theoretical construct mm -hmm. of what it is because we can all get lost in that. Absolutely. Um, there's no, do you give them any written information before you see them or is this is all conversation? It depends on the person. Uh -huh. Usually I agree and, and this is interesting because right away we get into the, the financial end of things. Mm -hmm. Usually I'll agree to meet with them. And for some people, they're ready to come for a lesson. You know, they're ready mm -hmm. to take the risk and actually pay for a lesson and come. Some people aren't. So mm -hmm. I might agree to meet with them for a half hour to talk about it and, you know, not give them a lesson. And at that point, for someone who's not ready to jump, I probably would have a lot more materials on hand mm -hmm. to give them. And then recently I've been developing over the last six months or so some very user-friendly materials, some of which are visuals, mm -hmm. both video and illustrative, graphic design mm. things. And so I'm, I'm very free about sending those out because I like them, first of uh -huh. all, they're fun, and they're really made to convey the principles in a very simple way. So sometimes I'll send that out ahead of time. Usually that's after the first lesson, though. Okay. Um, and there's no forms that you use or anything? Do you like know, for that. the longest time, I was a massage therapist for 21 years. Uh huh. 16 of those years were side by side with my Alexander practice. So I did that until 2005. And I always did a very detailed intake. And I actually did written reports after every appointment. That was for massage and Alexander technique? That was technique? for massage. And then I carried it over for oh, okay. Alexander because I had a joint practice with the two things. Um, but I've really gotten away from that. And I think a lot of it is because I work so much with artists and I work so much when I travel that, and I work a lot with groups. So I've gotten away from the writing everything down. I've also been at it a long time. So I think that things have fallen into patterns for me, patterns that I recognize mm -hmm. when people are talking about what's going on for them. Usually I've seen it before uh -huh. at this point, although I can be surprised. <laughs> Yes, can't we all? Um, so, 
How important is a first lesson? Oh boy. <laughs> this is an interesting thing. I have I recently heard and I can't remember which teacher again. I'm always culling from other people's uh -huh. experience. What she said was, you know, if I can just get somebody through the door, I'm made or they're yeah. made, they'll get it because the technique is so powerful and it's so, um, it's so accessible mm -hmm. in its way. But I do find that that's not always the case. There are some people who really aren't quite ready for it or they're not going to get yeah. it, Yeah, no. which makes me often doubt myself as a teacher. But then I remember, wow, there are 10 people who did get it and one person mm -hmm. who didn't. So I would say, I would say my focus for a first lesson is simplicity and accessibility. Mm, that's nice. So when the student walks through your door for the first time, how do you start? Do you, do you kind of continue that conversation before about finding out more background information and the discussion that you were having, or do you go straight into, um, teaching of some sort. I definitely continue the conversation. And now back to your question, I realize mm -hmm. when I have a phone call with somebody, I do jot things down. I still have an analog appointment book. Uh -huh. I'll jot things down next to their name uh -huh. so that when people come in, I remember the conversation <laughs> better. Yes. But I'll often ask them to reiterate because now we're meeting face to face. Mm -hmm. I also have an interesting thing for most of my teaching, which is one day a week I work at at someone else's studio in town, a colleague's studio, but most of the time I work at a studio at my home and there's a path that leads a little ways through the woods to my studio. Yes, there is. So, <laughs> so for a new student, I meet them at the car where they've driven in and I walk down the path with them and I, of course I'm already observing how they're moving. Uh -huh. And so there's this little prequel. So that may give me some questions to ask right off the bat. But I always have two chairs facing each other not too close, but you know, mm -hmm. in a in a comfortable yeah. distance, and we sit down at the beginning and probably chat for five minutes. Some people start to go on and mm -hmm. on and on, and there's a <laughs> tricky moment uh -huh. where one doesn't want to interrupt them. But sometimes while they're still talking, I get up and start working with them. I'll <laughs> say, for instance, we could look at you know how uh -huh. your head is balanced, something like that. Mm, that's good. Um... So it sounds like there's maybe not a specific place. You, well, I mean, maybe you always start with them sitting, but or is there something, if you have a choice about it, they're not going on and on, for instance, <laughs> that, you, that you like to kind of start or some standard things that you always introduce in a first lesson? Well, it's interesting that this is recently changing for uh -huh. me, and it's changing also in the larger groups. Huh. This, and this is you're getting to a, a later question, so we'll address it here. You know how things have changed over the years. Yeah, so. they change all the time. They change. Well, they go along for a while, and mm -hmm. everything feels pretty comfortable, and then it begins to shift for me, and then I present things differently. So the latest way I have begun to think about this. This is as of last week. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it, because I'm preparing to go teach big groups in a, in a couple of weeks in South America. And there I have to be very clear because I'm in translation. It's not my language. Uh -huh. So I can't go on and on and on. I have to be pretty clear about what I'm going to do. So what began to formulate for me last week as I was taking a walk, which tends to be my Alexander thinking time, is that we're really working with three things. One is we're working with a new concept of coordination and movement, a concept that most people don't know about. And in, a, in very brief, I would call that the tensegrity model, the suspension model of how we're built. And most people don't know about that or they don't consider their bodies that way. They have a, an experience of a lot of downward pressure. And so I introduce the concept and I have little models and I have little games, you know, lots of things like that. And, and then the second thing after sort of understanding the concept is, is teaching somebody how to practice the concept so that they can master it on their own over time. Obviously, they're not going to get that all in one lesson. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is, what is this? What's the concept? Mm -hmm. The second is, most of the lesson is built around how can I master the concept? Mm -hmm. And those are using all the principles that we all know about who are teachers. Mm -hmm. Chair work, table work, moving and walking, um, perhaps things, little things to work on 
in your daily life. The lie down, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the final one, and I actually find that this one's the key, and maybe not the one we're all best at, uh -huh. <laughs> and certainly the hardest to teach, is how do I return to it? So how do I return to this practice that I've done? And how do I return to this concept that I know is the right concept when I'm in the middle of a business meeting or I'm running to catch the bus? Mm -hmm. and, and to me, there we start to get into training the attention. How do we bring our attention back to ourselves? So that one feels to me like a really, really important one. It's easy to stop after one and two and send mm -hmm. someone out the door. So that kind of ties into a question I had about if you give students homework at, at the end of your first lesson. It sounds like those things kind of lead into that somewhat. Yes, exactly. I will point out now, for instance, if we're doing chair work, I have little games that people can play with their sit bone balance. Little in, in the mm -hmm. guitar circle work, there are ways you learn the fretboard and the use of the right and left hand that are called the primaries and then the secondaries, the, the simple, mm -hmm. simple exercises and then the ones that are a little more complex. And I have found working in that context that I now am, am formulating and accumulating sort of a series of primaries and some secondaries where I can give somebody a little something to work on. And I also find humor is important. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that comes up a lot with people about their work, if they have sitting work, either at the computer or they have to go to meetings or if they work on their feet, is I'll say, okay, so you're in the hallway and somebody comes up to you and they're talking to you and you start to get bored, right? They go, they're go, they going on and on. So you start to shift your balance over your feet, the balls of your feet and your heels, and you play with your balance. They never know it, but you're practicing your Alexander. So I'll tend to send people out the door with a few little tricks like that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, could there be um, some factors that might influence you to do things differently, to take a different approach? And what? Yes. What if somebody's in be? a lot of pain, yeah. um, probably we're going to make it to the table sooner rather than mm -hmm. later to teach them how to work and lie down. This is not always true. Sometimes someone who's doesn't have a lot of tone in the body, lying down is probably the worst thing. And then I might work with their painful situation by teaching them to be upright. Mm -hmm. But most often when somebody's really, pain often goes with a whole lot of tension. Yes. And a whole lot of sort of high powered living where someone never ever stops. So those people, I think of it as grounding them or putting them in time out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those people I will put either on the floor or on the table. More and more, I've been using the floor for people who can get onto the floor because they don't have a table at home, but so, they do have a floor. So is that something for every lesson or kind of really in the first lesson to introduce, this is how you get into this yourself? Um, you know, well, that's uh, a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on the person. Yeah. Definitely depends on the person. I have a few long time students, really long time. I counted up with someone the other day. She's been coming for 17 years. Oh, wow. And she's in her mid 70s now. She just makes a beeline for the table when she comes in. Mm -hmm. She's not that interested in learning. She wants to be sorted out. And you know, I still, I love her. She's great. And I actually had a great experience with her. She had a knee replacement a few years ago. And I'm always agonizing. Is she learning? She All she does is get table work. And I went to the rehab center to work with her. And I was walking down the hallway. And I saw the nurses go by and the other patients go by. And everybody was kind of pulled down and kind of slumpy. And then I saw this person out of the corner of my eye. And I didn't expect this lady to even be on her feet yet. I saw a person who was really up, really balanced. And I whipped around. And there she was. She was out in the lunchroom area of the rehab center. And she's up she's got it. so I thought okay fine if for her it's about table work that's fine mm -hmm. that's she, interesting. she carries it on on her own mm -hmm. so not everybody is a cellist who wants to learn how to use you know her right baby finger more effectively some people aren't that interested in the finer points mm -hmm. um, so I adapt and maybe I shouldn't adapt as much as I do but I do I adapt so is there anything you deliberately do not introduce um, 
in the first lesson and why would that be? That's a really good question. Um, I'm going to think about it. I would say I don't so often tell the Alexander story anymore but of course I I wrote a book and it's in there so I feel like that's kind of taken care of <laughs> um, so if people are interested and in, some people ask about the origin of the technique and of course I give them the stories I think what I tend not to do over much is use use words that we think of as sort of Alexander jargon is how someone else might mm -hmm. think of it. We think of it as the real definition of the principles. So instead of telling someone about inhibition, I'll give, I'll say, take a little moment to pause or stop with me for a second and let's look at what we're doing. I'll, I'm much more likely to use generic language that people do readily understand. Yeah. Um, instead of means where by an end gaining, it'll be, you know, we don't have to hurry to do that. We could break it down into small pieces. Coming to standing, I'll say there are probably about five or six pieces here in this movement that we could stop and look at. And then you could practice some of these when you move at home. Mm -hmm. So I think I tend to stay away from the more uh, philosophical, more complex ideas, except with more advanced students where you start to find you need the technical terms to get a little deeper yeah I think some of the people once they really get into it they like that often well they kind of need it because yeah. you're in territory where they're trying to perfect pretty complex skills yeah and they may be reading about it themselves so exactly and they've done more reading yeah sometimes people will come in and they will have read quite a bit and then we can hit the ground running mm -hmm. um, that definitely happens and in groups you know people often come and they're prepared they know what's going on already a bit interesting um so do you have any I, we touched on this a bit in the beginning you mentioned you had some um information that you give people is are there specific things that you might hand out at the end of a first lesson i tend nowadays to send them to people digitally uh-huh um I also do have the way my teaching has shaken down in the guitar circle and the big groups is within the concept of the tensegrity structure. I tend to teach five relations, five relationships within the body that when they interact, put us into tensegrity balance. Mm. So I have now five schematic drawings for each of those relations mm -hmm. and in the first lesson, we usually get to a couple of them. We don't get to all five, but they, I have people see all five. And just in very quick sequence, it's the head-neck relationship, the torso-leg relationship, the head-pelvis counterbalance, the breathing coordination, and the arms out and away from the, from the body. So, so I'll send people these little follow-up pictures so that they have something they can look at and say, oh, yeah, that's what we did. Um, I also have writing about each of those things. I now have little videos about those things. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. And also the center eight entries in my book of 40 days. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mind body 40 days is these relations. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people go off carrying the book. Not always. I don't sort of make every first mm -hmm. lesson an opportunity to sell a book, but, but it is useful and it is the way I teach. So mm -hmm. it sort of lets them into my world. And if they want to study with me, they have a sense of what they're getting into. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, are there any things that you did yourself or that you see maybe new teachers sometimes getting into that kind of a potential kind of pitfalls or mistakes that they could make? Oh, in gosh. A, in I a new lesson. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I still make them sometimes. Um, Although I had a surprise recently. There's inevitably the student who seems not to get anything that's going on. They mm -hmm. look at you, you're using language <laughs> they don't care about. They don't want to think about themselves in this way. Why would anyone do this? And I actually had a student like this about four or five weeks ago. And I was just as devastated as always. You know, the person mm -hmm. left and I thought, that was awful. That was just terrible. They hate it. They're never coming back. And in fact, the guy did come back. Uh -huh. um, 
I would say when the person seems not to be getting it, I tend to talk more. I tend to try harder. I mm -hmm. tend to probably go into a low grade panic because I know it works, but they're not really getting it at all. So, so I would say, yeah, I think, I think we try to do too much in a lesson. We try too hard to convince somebody and sell it. I can hear myself when I start to <laughs> sell it. Mm -hmm. And when I start to sell it, I tend to no longer be doing it. Mm. I tend to go into a different kind of personality. So for me, inhibiting, uh -huh. staying quiet, <laughs> staying with myself, maybe listening to them and their reservations a little more rather than trying to convince the person that this is the way to do things. Mm -hmm. It's very tricky. And I'm now realizing if I can get people to a group class, they can be in a situation where other people have similar reservations and similar questions mm -hmm. and suddenly it doesn't become so personal. Mm -hmm. So one-on-one, -on -one, you know, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm right, you're wrong, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm guessing also in a group class, you might have others who don't have the same reservations, so they get to see that too. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Some people maybe have a bit more experience, so mm -hmm. they can see where they're headed down the line of ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, as we get near to finishing up, is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners about your approach to a first lesson or any tips or advice that you've pearls of wisdom <laughs> you know I guess it's a it's a mark of my getting older I would say have fun mm -hmm. um, be hospitable enjoy the person set up a situation that's comfortable for the person coming in have water that you offer them chat a little bit um, make your make your space welcoming try not to be too pedantic <laughs> And I guess I'll, I can finish up with a tiny story, which is a gentleman who came for quite a, quite a lot of lessons over a period of time. He turned to me one day, and he had had some other Alexander experience in a different place. He had moved to town. And he looked at me and he said, I really like the way you dumb this down. Mm. <laughs> and it took me aback. But then I thought, okay. I'm going to take that as a compliment mm -hmm. <laughs> because he keeps coming back. He really likes it. He's learning it. He was a very high-powered sort of military guy who'd become a lawyer. You know, all these things. Mm -hmm. He had a very high-powered life. He didn't want to know every little esoteric thing. He just wanted to know what to do for himself. Mm -hmm. So I would say make it simple, have some fun, and, and in a first lesson particularly, do less. Mm -hmm. That's that's always good advice, right? Yeah, it's yeah. what we're teaching, actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Sandra. This has been really interesting. That's um, some very valuable information, I think. Um, so, my guest today has been Sandra Bain Cushman, an Alexander Technique teacher in Charlottesville, Virginia. If you'd like to get in touch with Sandra, or you live in Charlottesville, we'll put a link to her website next to the interview and we'll also put a link up to a site where you can find a teacher anywhere in the world. Thank you so much Sandra for being on the show. Thank you Imogen, this was fun.